Welcome back to the Uranium Thiever channel. In today's video, we're running through all the expected changes coming with the December 5th update for Fallout 76. The player test server has been continuously updated, bringing with it a host of smaller changes each time to the two upcoming expeditions. But that isn't all the news we've got, as there was a recent developer Q&A on Discord, which answers some questions asked by the community about the future of Fallout 76. We have brand new information on the upcoming weather system and the different variations we can expect to see as well as multiple smaller changes that are currently live in the PTS as well, everything from a new vendor, new food items, and some adjustments to energy weapon damage. We're going to be covering a lot in today's video, potentially going over some old ground here and there, so if there's a section you want to jump to, then you can find chapters in the video's description. Up first, let's run through what we learned from the developer Q&A. On November 2nd, the Fallout 76 devs fielded a series of questions from the community, mainly focused on Atlantic City, but also a couple of other interesting ones thrown in. For warning, a couple of these aren't going to be the news a lot of players wanted to hear, so let's start with the not so good first. The forbidden camp budget question, are there any plans to increase the camp budget? Answer, no. As of right now, there are no plans in the roadmap, and it was interesting to hear that mentioned, to change the camp budget. However, new items are being designed in the most efficient way possible, with new prefabs also getting a mention. And to be fair, this is something 76 has done pretty well for a while now, and that is the quality of new items have been steadily improving. And this has also been reflected in the size of some of these new items too, using the Flamingo unit's metric system. So some of the new items like the huge new prefabs like the Wildwood Tavern only set you back a couple of Flamingos. And I expect to see something similar with the upcoming Woodland Retreat, which looks like it might be the biggest prefab so far. However, these massive new prefabs, just like some of the massive new shelters, need to be decorated. And decorating in Fallout 76 can quickly chew through your budget, so I think there needs to be some balance there with that in mind. Do big items need to come pre-decorated, or should there be modular options for decorating different rooms? Otherwise, it's almost pointless having all of that extra space if you simply just don't have the budget to fill it. Interested to get people's thoughts on that one in the comments though. Moving on, how does the team choose which weapons get paints as rewards, and how does the team design them? It's a very personal question, I think, with certain weapons seemingly missing out pretty regularly, and the answer clarifies that in general, art direction for weapon skins is decided after input from both employees and players. Hopefully that means we'll be seeing more skins for underutilized weapons then in future. Moving on to the Atlantic City related questions, potential rewards from the new expeditions include a selection of gaming tables and slot machines from the casino that you can place on your own camp. But it's been confirmed that currently you cannot play games against other players, even though you will be able to get poker tables for example. I'll be running through the other Atlantic City related questions later on when we talk about the newest versions of the expeditions. For now, let's move on to the new loadouts, new locations and a new vendor. Up first then, those level 20 pre-made loadouts are going to be coming on December 5th. These are postponed from a previous release, and they don't really seem to have undergone too many changes in the PTS, but if you wanted to see the current options, here they are on screen now. You can pick from Commando, Slugger, Gunslinger, Shotgunner, and Specialist. Or completely ignore any of these and enter the Wasteland at level 2. The donation box located just down the stairs is already in the live game, but another box can also be found now at the White Spring, so look out for that. Taking a look now at the map around Vault 76, we have a series of new locations, and each of these is dedicated to a particular group, giving new players a chance to acclimatise to the factions of Appalachia. A couple of points of interest though with these, Organ Cave, which is filled with cultists, has several entrances, with one previously blocking a popular camp spot. After testing this in the latest PTS though, it appears that you can now place down a camp spot like normal. Heading over to see the Brotherhood of Steel at Forward Station Tango, look out for this little easter egg. It's very easy to miss, but written in the notes you can find in this tent, you learn that the APC down the hill actually drove here, which is pretty huge considering the vast majority of vehicles in the series simply do not work. Nothing much else comes of this way for the moment. Finally, we have the mysterious renovations of the Gilman Lumber Mill, which turned out to be the responders. Adding two new named characters you can speak to, you can pick up an easy to complete miscellaneous mission from Lane Platt, as well as learn a bit about the responders faction as a whole. June Seaver is a new vendor who sells a selection of new weapon skins and a new backpack skin, the Vault Survival Backpack, which you should be getting automatically once you've left the vault. The weapon skins are rusted, gunmetal, and Vault Tech paints, which can be applied to the 10mm pistol, 44 pistol, baseball bat, combat rifle, and pump action shotgun. Up next, let's run through a host of smaller adjustments to legendary loot, damage balancing, and melee buff changes. Legendary creatures in Fallout 76 will now drop legendary items based off of their rank. An example being a 3 star legendary enemy will now drop a corresponding 3 star item. A welcome change indeed. There are some pretty big changes coming to some enemy types as well. Robots, anglers, floaters, and pretty much any enemy that has an inherent missile based attack is seeing those damage numbers reduced. 
and here's a full table of the affected enemies. Elemental damage will now be increased by perks, for example rad damage of an automatic radiant rifle will be increased by commando perks, and the same being the case for fire, cryo and poison damage. Finally the chem overdrive doesn't stack anymore with other chems, only one chem with a critical damage bonus can be active at one time. A significant set of changes up next, we have some changes to melee buffs. The recipes and effects of melee buffs have been fundamentally changed, none will stack like they did before, and to counter this there are significant increases instead. There are also some new variants too thrown in. Note that these are on the PCS so they could be subject to change, and the percentage damage figures are base numbers. So up first we have a series of light items, um, these are light Yagwai ribs, which is plus 20% to melee damage, some light mutant hound chops which is the same, and some light mutton chops as well, and all of the following have plus 40% to melee damage. Glowing meat steak, mutant hound chops, yaogwai ribs, and mutton chops. Now we move on to 60 minute buffs, we have the tasty yaogwai roast, which is plus 85% to melee damage, tasty mutant hound stew, which is also the same, and the tasty mutton meat pie. Some interesting adjustments there, next let's run through an all new feature coming to Fallout 76, weather control stations. These new devices can be placed down in your camp, and will immediately change the surrounding weather to the designated weather for each machine. Currently there doesn't seem to be functionality similar to Collectrons, where you can just adjust what they search for irrespective of the variety you've placed down. Instead each weather comes with a unique station, and currently a total of 4 of these have been data mined or added to the PTS. These are Clear Sky which is slated to be an Atomic Shop release, Atlantic City Boardwalk which doubles up nicely as night, and this is actually a Season 15 reward, and Snow which is perhaps the most interesting one of the bunch. And it's slated to be an Atomic Drop release, but sadly was mentioned on a recent Professor Twitch stream where it was stated that it'll be coming next year. So not ideal as this would have been perfect for Christmas camps, and hopefully that changes. Finally, a Radstorm weather has also been data mined, but I expect we could see almost any type of weather appear in the future. These are a very interesting new feature, and the prospect of walking around the wasteland visiting camps without knowing which weather has been set down until you walk in the radius could be a lot of fun. Anyway, we briefly touched on it there, but let's discuss Season 15 quickly. This will be starting alongside the update, and is an Atlantic City theme to match the new expeditions. Unsurprisingly, the rewards reflect this with a series of poker themed weapons, character outfits, and a power armor suit which are all taken from characters on the scoreboard. There will also be a new survival tent, and a unique weapon called the Circuit Breaker. It's a 10mm pistol with some pretty handy special effects, it uses fusion cells and mods are similar to the normal 10mm, but the big differences are a hidden anti-armor effect, an optical flash effect on critical hits, and a plus 15 faster reload speed, and then finally a bonus effect on the last shot of a magazine. And this is an explosion that actually triggers on a hit, and will stun nearby enemies. Some very unique effects thrown in there for this relatively unassuming weapon. With that we've reached the end of the smaller changes, and it's time to focus on the big news. The two Atlantic City expeditions in part 1, and what seems to be most of the good stuff coming with part 2 sometime next year. I'll explain that momentarily, but first let's discuss how the latest iterations of part 1's expeditions are actually looking. So it is now crystal clear that part 1 of the Atlantic City update called Boardwalk Paradise is only going to be these two new expeditions. And honestly there's a hell of a lot riding on part 2, as this first update is a like for like expansion for the pit. And most of the new features teased with expeditions, including the quests, the nightclub in Appalachia, the New Jersey Devil boss fight, and the Mooney armor are all part 2. We will run through everything we know about that momentarily, but let's do some comparisons first. So just like the pit missions, tax evasion and the most sensational game are split into modules with bonus objectives active during with the entire variables mission. for each module each time we start an expedition. Thanks to Coffee for providing me with this overview table, and as you can see there are actually less variables with these new expeditions compared to the pit. For example tax evasion could start with an eliminate audit leader, eliminate showmen, or a grenade toss task outside, and then once you've headed inside you could be purging accounting records and terminals, disabling bugs, or looting evidence from enemies before gaining access to a vault. Before finishing up in Quentinos for a fight against Buttercup, I was glad to see is now actually wearing some unique power armor. So what does this actually mean? In short, that these missions are likely to have a shorter shelf life than the pit did, and that isn't too great if I'm honest. Of the two, I think Tax Evasion is the better expedition, as the most sensational game actually has a couple of things I really dislike, and these issues are really centered around the location and what you can actually do inside as it seems to be a really big missed opportunity considering the work that seems to have gone into them. The aquarium interior for the second part of this mission is really cool, but what you actually do in the aquarium seems incredibly basic and has no relevance at all to the location itself. Once you've headed inside you'll be doing one of these. Throwing tatoes at naughty showmen who are stuck in stockades until they learn their lesson. 
protecting an escortee while they collect blood packs, or simply fending off attacking enemies. And the final showdown is against the Batsuri twins, Juchi who uses a sledgehammer in combat, and Julian who uses an assault rifle. It definitely seems like the design of this mission was inspired by the most dangerous game by Richard Connell, with you surviving a winner-takes-all manhunt against human opponents. But with that in mind, and I'm assuming there won't be any significant changes at this last stage, these final human bosses seem incredibly forgettable. Wearing a reskinned Atomic Shop outfit and using non-unique weapons, I personally found this incredibly underwhelming. Perhaps I'm being overly harsh and most likely unrealistic, but given the location, it could have been cool to see some kind of aquatic boss instead, or at the very least, some kind of tie-in to the aquarium itself. Irrespective of what I think though, you'll be getting to test these out yourself pretty soon, and overall, I do think the mission stages, enemy variety, and overall, an overall narrative was stronger with both of the pit missions. To end this on a more positive note though, let's discuss everything we know about part 2. Minor spoiler warning as we will be discussing a variety of data and information that is of course still subject to change. So if you want to go in completely blind, this section might not be for you. America's Playground is slated to be the name of part 2 and will implement open exploration of Atlantic City. Uh, there will be three new main quests and two side quests as well as a third expedition in Atlantic City that will likely focus on the municipal government faction in an area called the Flooded City Center. These main quests actually relate to a new location in Appalachia that is currently in the PTS but is under construction. And this is the new nightclub called the Rose Room. Mob hits, a family on the run, and a quest to obtain True Devil's Blood are some of what we could be seeing, and this is definitely shaping up to be the part of the update I'm most interested in, as the Lesser Devils introduced in Part 1 are not adults, and the True Jersey Devil teased in the developer showcase is shaping up to be Fallout 76's next big boss fight. Of course, all of this will tie into the new Chem Devil's Blood and the associated storyline alongside that, and yeah, overall it sounds really, really promising. And a welcome return, it would seem, to more traditional narrative missions we haven't really seen since Steel Rain. During the developer Q&A, there were of course some questions about Atlantic City, and it was teased that there should be lore we can discover about the origins of the new enemies, like the Overgrown and the Jersey Devil. To be honest, part 2 can't come quick enough, but that's it for today. Plenty of things covered in this video, and the December update is bringing quite a lot to Fallout 76 when it comes to smaller adjustments and some added flavour for the base game, and two new expedition missions being the highlight, which will of course be bringing you a host of new rewards. If you want to see everything you can earn from them, then check out my rewards guide video covering those. There's a link to that on screen now. How do you feel about the new update though? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. If you enjoyed this particular video, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. We post a variety of Fallout 76 content, so turning on the bell icon is definitely the best way to stay up to date. With that said, bro, I'm off. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.